and welcome to the Daily Space Weather. We'll also include meteorology at the end of the video. We've got new sunspot, one new sunspot rising, it's beta class. It represents one of the most likely places to see large solar flares, especially while it is still on the limb. So this new sunspot group right here is beta gamma class. Also these groups over here setting pose the likelihood for producing large flares. Here's some more imagery from SDO. This is three wavelengths of ionized iron. It is iron star. We'll also show the intensity gram. And you can see most sunspots here are in the southern hemisphere at the moment. And we've got a radio flux that's all the way down to 102 solar flux units. We'll get to it. First global seismicity, largest quake of the past. Oh, and by the way, there is an earthquake drought occurring. <clears throat> earthquake droughts end in large earthquakes. So here's 2010. You can see how many seven magnitude earthquakes happened in that year based on those red bars. There's 2011. There's 2012. You can see a large earthquake drought during 2012. Although Nibiru never arrived during this year, so that, that wasn't a thing. Also, there's 2013, 2014, and so on. The point I'm making is that earthquake droughts end in large earthquakes. Look what happened in 2018, a long earthquake drought, and then a massive series of large earthquakes. So this is an, another earthquake drought. Largest quake of the past 24 was a 5.7 in the mountains of Ecuador. Not too far from the Colombian border, that's the location of that 5.7 magnitude quake. It occurred at 1333 universal time yesterday. So we're just going to scroll up the list here. No major quakes, no quakes over a 5.7 magnitude. Several 5 magnitude quakes, like this 5.2 at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. A 5.1 in the Ryukyu Islands of Japan. The volcanic Ryukyu Islands of Japan. Also a 5.1, kind of near Siberia. And we'll just scroll up the list here. If we miss anything, let us know in the comments what we've missed. We appreciate your input. So that's what's going on as far as earthquakes. Remember, folks, if you're in an earthquake-prone zone, have a plan to be an asset, not a liability in a disaster. If you, if you know which building facades may collapse, hey, that's better than no preparation at all. I mean, a bug-out bag, maybe a, a battery backup for your fridge might be a good idea. Stuff like that can make a huge difference. Continuing on to volcano coverage, Bardarbunga in central Iceland has continued to inflate. However, keep in mind that these events can happen for years and years with no eruption. We do see some earthquakes. I know we covered one a few days ago, a 4.9 under the central portion of Iceland, the location of the Bardarbunga volcano. So serious ground deformation continuing since February 2015, and moving way out west to Shivaluch, or I guess as far east as you can go, it is west of the international date line, which makes it east, Shivaluch erupting in an explosive fashion and producing a flight level 140 over the Kamchatka Peninsula. Sakurajima also erupting, pretty decent eruption there at Sakurajima, flight level 110, it's an 11,000 foot plume of volcanic ash over the Isle of Kyushu. Mount Ibu on the Isle of Halmahera, Indonesia, exploding as well, flight level 070. Semeru exploding, moving to East Java, Indonesia. 14,000 foot ash plume as Semeru explodes. 8,000 foot ash plume as Dekono explodes on the Isle of Halmahera. Fuego 
Moving to Central America in Guatemala, exploding as well. Flight level 160. Nevado de Ruiz, flight level 220. That's located in Colombia. Nevado de Ruiz is exploding. Two volcanoes in Ecuador, Sangay and Revenador, both exploding. Flight level 220. A 22,000-foot ash plume over Sangay. A 15,000-foot ash plume over Revenador. Please don't pull vault to Caldera. And closing out the list, we've got Sabancaya in Peru. A little uptick there at Sabancaya as it also explodes. Flight level 270. It's a 27,000-foot ash plume. Once again, don't pull vault to Caldera. It could be unhealthful. And you won't be able to see the rest of our awesome space weather content. So let's cut back to the closest star. So here's El Sol, a.k.a. Helios. And this is ionized helium. Did you know that the sun produces more helium at solar maximum than it does at solar minimum? Yeah, there's nuclear fusion. And a lot of that seems to be happening on the surface. I'll leave it there. Maybe that's too controversial for some of you who actually understand heliophysics. But in any case, let's show some more imagery as we've got some higher likelihood locations for solar flares than others. One of those spots is over here where these sunspots are setting. And the other spot is this new sunspot that just rose. This is some composite imagery. This is 304 angstroms plus 193. So don't be surprised to see a significant flare or flares from that area as well. The radio flux is all the way down to 102 solar flux units, so we're seeing, despite a new sunspot having risen, it's decent sized, but an overall reduction in solar activity. So here is this black line, that's the 10.7 centimeter radio flux. The line below it is the sunspot number, and if you're paying attention, you'll notice how proportional the sunspot number is to the 10.7 centimeter radio flux. And let's continue on. No warnings from NOAA about geomagnetic storms or geomagnetic unrest. We are expecting a CME strike, a minor one. Maybe we'll see a KP4, maybe a brief period of KP5 geomagnetic storm conditions early to midday tomorrow. So we're expecting it somewhere in this range right here. Expecting a CME strike and expecting it to be a glancing blow, not a direct strike but I think there is some ejecta almost here at Earth. So next we're looking at Earth's magnetic moment from space, and we do have some likely erroneous data here in the solar wind. We'll get to that in a moment. This is the magnetohydrodynamic pressure modeled by the Space Weather Modeling Framework. Keep in mind it does rely on the solar wind data from ACE and DISCOVER. In order to create this model, you can see a very significant reduction in the pressure there, and that is because of Again, likely erroneous data on the ACE and DISCOVER. We'll get to it. First, ground magnetic perturbations. We showed Earth's magnetic moment from space. Here's Earth's magnetic moment from the ground. The space weather modeling framework here is modeling nanotesla magnetic flux density on the surface of the planet. And you'll see it suddenly drop off here. after a sudden and weird increase. Again, it's likely based on erroneous data. So we did see a brief period of geomagnetic unrest here. That's that yellow bar. The KP index, or planetary K index, is a measurement of global geomagnetism. And let's move to the real-time solar wind. So here's the erroneous data that we're talking about. And you see this blue and green line switch. That is the switchover from the, from the discover to the ACE measuring the solar wind components. And you can see uh, it looks like ACE is all over the place here. And errors are suspected in the data, but the, the best we can tell you at the moment is that the solar wind speed is about 400 kilometers per second, and the solar wind density is very diffuse. Hardly one proton per cubic centimeter. And oftentimes we do expect the plasma environment between Earth and Sun to be swept free of plasma 
following things like coronal mass ejection strikes and following things like extended coronal hole wind streams. So that is part of the reason why it is sort of expected to see a very low density solar wind because we had an extended period of coronal hole high speed stream which just subsided yesterday. We covered it on our space weather video. So next we're going to move into magnetic data and we're going to attract you to the channel. So there's the GOES magnetometer readings from the GOES 16 and GOES 17 from their geosynchronous near equatorial orbits. If you're new to the channel, the N's and M's, they stand for noon and midnight local time for the satellite, giving you some insight into where they're located. Did you know this video was originally streamed live to Twitch? Thanks to our Twitch followers, twitch.tv slash smash mash Today's featured product is the unit patch of the Galactic Federation Special Forces. Are you sick of what's going on, on in your town? Are you sick of what's going on in your county? Are you sick of what's going on in your state? Are you sick of what's going on in your region? What about your country? How about the continent? What about the hemisphere? Are you sick of what's going on on the whole planet? Lots of people are. So I would say to you, Universum Liberate. That would be the motto of the Galactic Federation Special Forces. Those of us who are involved in galactic scale special forces, well, we would prefer to see each of you free. And that's what we're talking about here. The symbolism represents the Milky Way galaxy, signal strength and security, and instantaneous reach. That little bright spot in the upper right, that's classified as to what that represents. However, the products are spectacularly high resolution, so help to shield the galaxy from nonsense, fraud, and basic slavery by saying Universum Liberate. Start a conversation about freedom and liberty. Next, if you want to support the channel via subscription services, please consider becoming a member of the Smash Team at the gold or silver subscription level. Those are monthly subscription levels. They help us to increase the probability this content will continue to exist and remain publicly visible. Gold and silver Smash Team members get the GDAX daily reports. You can find links to that at the homepage at smashomash.com. Welcome to the New York Renaissance. We are in the process of writing a publication to explain the plausible mechanism underlying the solar sunspot and solar polar field reversal cycles. You can find all our social media links there, a permanent invite link to our Discord chat. So drop us a line there if you like. Again, welcome to the New York Renaissance. Links to the Smash O merch and the Smash team and our forum. A bunch of new members on the forum all linked on the home page. Press like and subscribe if you enjoy the content. Thanks to everybody who's tuned into the YouTube channel or wherever you're viewing the content. Make sure you check out the YouTube channel. There's all kinds of videos there that have nothing to do with space weather. And once again, thanks for tuning in to the Smash News Network, least busted name in news. Next, we're looking at the polarity of the heliospheric current sheet and Earth remains in a South Pole current sheet and we expect to remain there for the foreseeable future. South Pole current sheet shown here in red, North Pole current sheet shown on the opposite side of the sun in green. Next, the solar line of sight field plot, also the solar magnetogram here. And we've got a bunch of South Pole magnetism facing the Earth at the moment as the solar polar field reversal process is taking its time at the beginning here of solar cycle 25. Here's our line of sight coronal hole plot, and there is one new coronal hole rotating in here in the south. You can see all of those south pole oriented coronal holes. One of them is quite well defined and moving into the earthly facing zone. And there's a great view of that. These coronal holes over here will become more defined as they rotate in, because keep in mind, folks, the solar corona is very bumpy. So there's a lot of plasma in between us and those coronal holes. And that is why they are not particularly visible or well-defined at the moment in this wavelength. I assure you, based on the magnetic data, the polarization of light, that indeed, those coronal holes are there. Next, we'll move to the realm of sunspots. So here is our detected flare 
uh, detected sunspot groups and flare probability monitors. Most likely places to see major flares would be from up here and from over here. Sunspot 3060, 3063, and 3064 are the most likely places along with this new sunspot here which will be known as 3067. It is beta gamma class. It does have two opposite polarity magnetic fields. We'll show you high res imagery of that toward the end of the video. Here's some more composite imagery. This is 1700 angstroms plus the continuum. And let's get a little closer. You can see some large sunspots here. Most of them are not particularly magnetically complex. This one here is interesting. We do see some, some umbral spread there. The leading umbra rotating a little faster than the trailing portion. And next we'll move to solar flares. There's your X-ray flux over the past three days and you can see a declining X-ray flux. No real surprise there with the declining of complex sunspots. Many of them set and hey, the sun has hot spots and cold spots. So the parts where you see lots of sunspots, those are hot spots and the spots where you see not a lot of sunspots, those are cold spots, at least in terms of X-ray output. Again, the most likely places to see large flares would be out of this new sunspot group right here, 3067. And out of these setting groups here. Spectacular composite imagery there in 131 and 171 angstroms from SDO. Here's a full disk view in 94 angstroms. And hey, once again, thanks for tuning into the channel. It's just the most in-depth daily space weather and most detailed imagery of the sun you'll find on the entire internet. Bar none, it's our channel. Once again, don't forget to press like, subscribe, share, press the notification bell. You may actually see through a notification when we're putting up a video, streaming live, etc. We do occasionally stream live to YouTube. Here's the ghost proton flux over the past three days. No relativistic particles showing up there. And here's a star chart. We always like people to be oriented. This is what's going on above our head over at Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania. We do have Venus, the Moon, Mars, and Jupiter all in the sky at the moment. And let's move on to our solar system forecast. This is from theplanetstoday.com. Keep in mind this is not to scale, and keep in mind the planets are not going to kill you, and neither is the Sun. Consumer tip. People might kill you because of incredibly idiotic decisions made. If the power grid goes down, a lot of people don't know how to survive without the power. So people might kill you. The sun and the planets aren't going to kill you. Thanks for leaving a comment, Ten man, Tin Man 1057, and good morning to you as well. Today we're drinking a blend of organic medium roast. Let us know in the comments what you're drinking. So here's our solar system forecast. We've got a crescent waning moon as we approach new moon. Here's the one-week forecast. There's where things will be on August 2nd. We will have a crescent waxing by that point as Mercury comes around to say hi once again on this side. So here is the coronagraph imagery. And we do have another coronal mass ejection. It looks like most of the ejecta will be off to the west here. So you can see that in yesterday's imagery, it happened at about 11 o'clock in the morning, right as our video was premiering, approximately. And there's some great imagery of that. It may have some Earth-directed components once again. So let's show today's imagery as well. So again, that's yesterday, and here's today. July 26th. And once again, we are expecting a coronal mass ejection strike early to midday tomorrow on Wednesday, July 27th. 
Well, that's today. We've only got 27 frames there. And let's show some additional imagery from Stereo A Coronagraph and the Soho Lasco C3. So here we've paused it here at 11.23 from Stereo A and 12.18 from the Lasco. You can see that CME there. Now for you new viewers, Earth would be off on this line approximately from Stereo A's perspective. And so that is somewhat Earthly directed in terms of north and south. And it looks like there is ejecta kind of on all sides of the coronagraph there. So I'm expecting some additional CME strikes here to show up, I'll say, late in the day on the 28th. So we'll just back this up and let it play through one time for you here, as we don't want the video to be too long, but we want it to be comprehensive. So we are going to include bonus features once again today and a meteorology segment. And let's continue on here to look at hydrogen alpha. Hydrogen alpha imagery from the ground-based solar observatory at El Taide, Spain, showing filaments. You can see all these dark regions. Those are absorption features. And they are the same phenomenon as these prominences. They're just in between the Earth and Sun. And the most likely place to see a coronal mass ejection at the moment would be from here and from here. Those are some significantly sized filaments. And let's take a look at the GO-16 SUVI, SUVI for the last couple of hours, the last about two and a half hours of solar activity here in ionized helium. When we do see coronal mass ejections, that's a great view. The GO-16 SUVI with its wide field. A narrower field is the SDO. Here's the house favorite, 171 angstroms for the past 24 hours. And let's get to the bonus of features. So starting out with the total electron content forecast, this will show you the most likely spots for GPS errors. Now they traditionally occur around the equator at noon. Most people that are trying to use GPSs are aware of this, that their GPSs typically work better at night than at noontime. And it's based on signal refraction. Free electrons cause the signal to not be accurate. So turn on your Wi-Fi location accuracy. If you suspect your GPS isn't working, it will help your navigational skills. Your GPS satellite's located at about 12 and a half thousand miles of altitude, just on the inner portion of the outer Van Allen belt. Satellite's community dashboard not showing any charging hazards at the moment. You can expect good communications from satellite-based stations. This is the GOES electron flux over the past 24 hours. This is just the electrons, the relativistic electrons, located at the F layer of the ionosphere. We'll also show that in a moment. First, the electron, the relativistic electron forecast there from NOAA, expecting fairly flat levels here. There's the one-year chart to put it in context. We're just in a normal operating range at the moment. Feel free to pause the video here. This shows you thermospheric temperatures, penetration of electromagnetic radiation into and out of the atmosphere, and molecular densities at the very diffuse outer layers of the atmosphere, like the thermosphere. The F layer of the ionosphere is located at about 300 kilometers of altitude. Here's the vibrational frequency of that. That is in megahertz, or millions of vibrations per second. It's like the measurement of the speed of an old computer in megahertz instead of gigahertz. That would be billions of vibrations per second. And here's the anomaly gram showing anomaly in megahertz from the 30-day median. Some low-frequency anomalies showing up there around the Central Atlantic, West Africa, 
and northern South America. Let's bring up the latest images. There's 1015 Universal Time Ionogram, and there's 1015 Universal Time Anomalygram. As we do daily, we'll show the latest intensity gram and latest magnetogram. There's Sunspot 3067. That will get a name today. And you can see indeed that it is beta class. So it's got a leading umbra of North Pole polarity and a trailing umbra of South Pole. And beta class sunspots much more likely to produce significant flares. As it moves off the limb, it becomes less and less likely to produce a major flare, but at the moment, it's pretty high likelihood to see some major flaring from that. And let's bring up another composite series of images from SDO. This is two species of ionized iron, that's 211 and 171 angstroms in green and blue, and 304 angstroms ionized helium in red. Great imagery there of our lively, not dying, and not in a grand solar minimum star. If you've got comments to leave directly for the closest star, Helios El Sol, a.k.a. the Sun, leave them in our comments. So now we're moving to the realm of meteorology. And what the heck are we showing here? Oh my God, is the world burning up? Well, I'm going to leave that up to you. You tell me. As at the Smash News Network, Least Busted Name and News, we're just citing lots of facts. So, there's some anomalously hot water here, very hot water here around Newfoundland. Check it out. That's really anomalously hot water in that area. But what we're looking at here are the currents. So we're looking at sea surface temperature anomaly and currents. And you can see the Gulf Stream is still indeed making its way to Ireland. So Europe clearly not freezing. Although I'll tell you what's very cold is Lake Superior. Check out the Lake Superior there. It's 18 degrees below normal temperature for this time of year. 18 degrees Fahrenheit below normal, Lake Superior. Kind of chilly. We've got some eddies happening in the Gulf of Mexico there. Again, that's sea surface temperature anomaly and currents to show the Gulf Stream. So we're going to switch to what we normally show here. We'll start with the surface winds of the Eastern world. There's the surface wind environment of this side of the planet. Here are the jet streams. Very incoherent and chaotic jet streams in the Northern Hemisphere. Powerful jet streams in the South. jet streams of the Americas look like this. And you can see most of the jet stream once again staying north of the U.S. And we have continuing to see an anticyclonic pattern here over the east central U.S. High pressure and a clockwise rotation. Here are the surface winds of this side of the planet. We show you the weather from a global perspective. Powerful low here. A wintry powerful low off the coast of Argentina. Here are the surface winds of Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. Once again, shout out to our viewers from all around the planet. Here are the jet streams of this side of the planet, blowing backwards over the Indian Ocean and Northern Africa once again. Very broken up jet streams here in the Northern Hemisphere. You can see they're all over the place. And a doubled up jet stream over South Africa and the Southern Ocean. Here's your weather.gov map. If your county's lit, click your county, head to weather.gov. We can't go over all that, but it's looking pretty hot in places like Northern Idaho, Eastern Washington, Northern Oregon. Those are excessive heat warnings. Also the central Southern US, some flood warnings there in places like 
Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah, also Illinois, Missouri, and Indiana. And those red areas there, those are flash flood warnings. Flash floods are pretty dangerous, folks. If you're at the base of a mountain and there's a flash flood warning, consider seeking higher ground because it's coming. Here is your NASA GOES lightning mapper. And as July wanes, the lightning continues. Pretty decent lightning there over the US. And here's a real-time lightning map. We've got some terrestrial strikes happening as we record and, well, as we stream the video, actually. Louisville, it looks like you might be in the crosshairs, but at the moment, there's an active cell north of Evansville. And we'll just zoom out. Once again, Putin is creating lightning over here in Russia. That's Putin's lightning. He's using a combination of technologies that are unable to create lightning, but people probably think he is. Putin creating inflation, lightning, and possibly monkeypox. Here's your windy.com pressure map. And you can see mixed pressures over the U.S. here. Because the jet stream is staying so far to the north, convective processes are largely at play, making for some likely chaotic weather in your location. Leave us a comment if you've seen some chaotic weather in your location. And let's continue on here to show a temperature anomaly forecast. So there's your temperature anomaly forecast based on the GFS model. You can see how hot it is in the Pacific Northwest and how cold it's expected to be over large portions of the central U.S. Keep in mind, temperatures are shown here in degrees Celsius. That's the GFS temperature anomaly forecast for the next 72 hours. Here's your pressure and precipitation forecast for the same period on the same model, the GFS model, over 72 hours. Again, pressure and precipitation. And at the end of that run, expecting some very strong storms in southern Indiana, Ohio, and West Virginia. Here's your radar.weather.gov Doppler radar map, which has been fickle lately. Let's press refresh and hope it animates. Fingers crossed. Waiting, waiting. Let's move on to the shortwave radiation satellite showing clouds and fog. Some rapid cloud nucleation happening here over places like Missouri and Illinois. As hot temperatures and wet ground put moisture in the air. Here you'll see it in the water vapor map as well. This is the NASA GOES Interactive Weather Satellite Suite water vapor map. An interesting pattern here of moisture making its way back toward the east coast of the U.S. That's part of that anticyclonic pattern, and you can see this overall. Clockwise rotation, the sign of an anticyclone overall high-pressure system there. And you can see clear skies over most of Oklahoma as that dry mass of air rotates clockwise. So let's try this again. I'll press refresh and hope for the best to show you the US Doppler radar imagery. Come on, radar.weather.gov. We've got a blazingly fast connection, so I can guarantee you that that is not the fault of the Smash News Network least busted name in news. There we go, we've animated now, and we'll show the lower 48. You can see Louisville and Cincinnati also, Indianapolis is going to get brushed by by a large system. Cincinnati, you're next. It's your recap. Clouds and fog using the shortwave radiation satellite. And last but not least, water vapor. When your Doppler is not giving you the full picture, use the water vapor satellite. It will make things clearer 
and we certainly hope that our video did so as well. And uh, yeah, just posting facts and not nonsense on the channel. Thanks for tuning in. Congratulations on realizing it exists. I've been your host, Dan, a.k.a. Smash-O-Mash, signing off. And may that solar wind be at your back.